OK? Uh, what I want to do is show you that symmetry is uh, it's not only beautiful, but it's also useful. And uh, I'm going to take you into the looking glass world of uh, symmetry and reflections in art, atoms, and even antimatter. Symmetry, it's long been an important part of, of architecture. There's something pleasing and elegant about it. And it seems, it seems universal in its attraction to us, that appeals to us across centuries and, and cultures. And we decorate buildings with tiling patterns, like this one from the Alhambra Palace in Spain. The six-pointed stars here are not only symmetric in themselves with a six-fold symmetry, but they also, together they form a repeating pattern, a periodic array of stars. And a more modern example was invented by the English mathematician Roger Penrose. There's an obvious symmetry here, but this pattern actually never repeats. It's not periodic. And you can check it out on the floor of the Science Gallery where the tiles are laid in the Penrose pattern. Now, remember the reflection symmetry of the Taj Mahal, that the, the left wing is the, image, the mirror image of the right wing. This butterfly has the same symmetry. If you look at the butterfly in a mirror, the image looks identical to the original animal. This seashell has an elegant symmetry to it with a left-handed spiral, but it's not symmetric in a mirror. If you reflect it in the mirror, you get a right-handed spiral, just like my left hand reflected in the mirror is, is a right hand. In the world of geology, diamond is both rare and beautiful. Diamond's a crystal. It's a regular periodic array of carbon atoms in, in a lattice structure. And in the 19th century, physicists proved, using mathematics of symmetry, that there are precisely 230 different crystal structures in 14 families. Salt is a poor cousin of diamond. It's in the same family. And the cubic structure of salt arises from the fact that the atoms, the sodium and chlorine atoms, are in a, a cubical array, a periodic array, um, which is a regular pattern. And salt is also symmetric in a, in a mirror. The cubical structure that you see in grains of salt arises from the, the microscopic structure of the atoms. So from symmetry in art and atoms, I'd li might like to move on to the um, subatomic world. Paul Dirac was an English physicist working in the 20th century. And he thought a lot about um, atomic particles such as electrons and, and nowadays quarks. He got the Nobel Prize for his work in, in uh, 1933. He invented an equation that describes the behaviour of electrons and quarks. And a lot of physicists think this is one of the most beautiful equations to come out of, of 20th century <coughs> physics. This equation tells us how electrons behave, and in particular how they behave when reflected in a mirror. Electrons, they're a bit like spinning balls. Um, a, a, like all subatomic, a lot of subatomic particles, electrons spin on their axis, like, like a spinning ball. And if we reflect a spinning ball in a mirror, we see it spins the other way. And the same is true of electrons. Dirac's equation tells us that if you reflect an electron in the mirror, it spins the other way. We can also imagine making a, a spinning ball spin the other way by taking a video of it and running the video backwards. I'm going to call this, this is like reflecting in time, so I'm going to call this a time mirror. Dirac's equation tells us how electrons behave when you reflect them in a time mirror. And staring at these equations and studying the symmetries, he saw that something was missing he found a new particle that had never been seen before. It was like an electron, it had the same mass, but it had a positive electric charge rather than a negative electric charge. He discovered what we now call antimatter. It's like a naturalist who finds a new species of animal that looks as though it's got a piece missing. The, the symmetry compels you to, to suggest that, that there's something there that ought to be there that's never been seen. And uh, this is a key point of, of what I want to say, that you can use symmetry to make predictions. So this is a time mirror. It's um, the large had part of the Large Hadron Collider at the European Particle Physics Facility at uh, CERN just outside Geneva. And um, it regularly produces particles and, and detects antiparticles. And this is a particle antiparticle produced in one of these machines. There's an energetic particle coming down from above, and the two symmetric spirals are a particle and an antiparticle pair. At a deeper level, the origin of these symmetries still remains a mystery, and it's an area of active research today. These three Japanese physicists got the Nobel Prize in 2008 for their work in trying to unravel these, these mysteries of symmetry. And their ideas rely crucially on another particle that's been predicted by symmetry and has never been seen, called the Higgs boson. And we're all waiting to see whether or not the, the LHC will discover the Higgs boson. So symmetry is not only beautiful, you can also use it to make predictions. Thank you.